Okay, today we're going to talk about tongues, what they are and what they aren't. Okay, we're going to start out in Genesis chapter 10, verse 5. Uh, there's something in the Bible, um, well, I shouldn't say in the Bible, but it's something about the Bible, and it, basically it's called the law of first mention. And many times you will have a word in the Bible is defined the very first time that it shows up. So it's always good to look in a concordance and see, you know, where a word shows up for the first time. And many times in the context, that word will be defined, and then that definition will stick with it throughout the entire text of the Bible. And that's definitely the case with the word tongue. So here we are, Genesis chapter 10, verse 5. By these were the isles of the Gentiles divided in their lands, every one after his tongue and after their families in their nations look down at verse 20 genesis 10 verse 20 these are the sons of ham after their families after their tongues in their countries and in their nations look down at verse 31 these are the sons of shem after their families after their tongues in their lands after their nations what are tongues languages languages exactly and many times a group of people is defined by their language you know you say well they're uh english they're french they're german you know it's you're being defined by your tongue and but here in genesis chapter 10 you have the three sons of noah japheth ham and shem and it describes who their descendants are and where they spread out to now this chapter here is not describing the events that took place right after the flood okay it's it's describing the descendants now this took many 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 years probably hundreds of years for all these you know you go down through there and it's listed and all the different people and and you know the uh verse 18 just as an example and the arvadite and the zemurite and the hamathite you know that didn't happen right boom after the flood. This took a little while. And that's going to be important here in just an, another minute. But look at verse 32. It says, These are the families of the sons of Noah after their generations in their nations, and by these were the nations divided in the earth after the flood. It was God's will that the nations be divided. And we're going to see why in just a minute. But after the flood, God didn't say, Okay, now everybody come together. Let's all, you know, make a big, nice city and where everybody, the whole family can be together. Now, he said, Japheth, you go over there. You be the father of the Gentile nations. Shem, you go to the, to the Orient, be the father of the Oriental, the Indian, the Jew. Ham, you go on down to Africa and be the father of the African people. Okay, Egypt is the land of Ham. Where is Egypt at? It's in Africa. Okay, those are the three main races now of course there are a lot of variations within those races but all races can be traced back to three to the sons of noah okay now look at chapter 11 verse 1 and the whole earth was of one language and of one speech well wait a second here i thought that there were all these different tongues we'll see if you remember what i said about genesis chapter 10 it's describing future events it's describing what took place over the next couple hundred years. But right after the flood, there was just one language. You know, if you would have gone to Japheth and Ham and Shem, they were all speaking the same language, and their kids were. And after the flood, that's all that there was. So you had their kids, and then they started having kids and kids and kids. You had one language. Now look, look what happens here. Verse 2. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower, whose top may reach unto heaven, and let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth." And the Lord got, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this will this they will begin to do, 
and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of the earth, of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, or some people say Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now, when I was a kid, I I don't know if I was taught this or if I just kind of thought this, but I thought the reason that God was mad at them was because they were building a tower to reach heaven. That isn't it. Obviously, God, you know, wasn't worried about anybody getting up to heaven with a tower. <laughs> You're not going to build a tower that big. It's impossible. Okay. What was, what was he upset about? What was the Lord upset about? They all had one language and they all came together. Isn't that interesting? And the, the thing that's very interesting actually about that, uh, you can look into this, you can look this up online, the Georgia Guidestones down in Elbert County, Georgia. There's a huge, big, I think it's granite, uh, big stones. And they have in eight different languages the ten planks, the ten plans of the New World Order. Okay? Of a one world government. And... It goes down through. I'll read a couple of them here. Number one, maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. That's the first plan of these people who are building the one world government. And this isn't conspiracy theory, by the way. This isn't, oh, you know, I heard this. You can go down and see the thing. You know, if you have Google Earth, you can actually look it up and you can zoom in on the thing and you can see it. And there's a little picture thing there. You can click on it and look at it. I mean, it's it's there. It's definitely there but how are you going to maintain humanity under 500 million there's almost 7 billion right now that's going to require a lot of people dying and if you look at these one world government people that's exactly what they want to do they want to kill off a lot of people bill gates just recently came out and said that uh, we need to reduce carbons you know co2 emissions which is not even real science and he said we need to reduce it to zero. Now that's impossible unless you kill, kill every man and woman and child on the planet. But Bill Gates is a eugenicist. And a lot of these big rich people are. Okay, but it says here, number two, guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. You know, in other words, forced sterilization and abortion. And number three, this one's interesting, unite humanity with a living new language hmm isn't that interesting you see the bible teaches that there's no no new thing under the sun and these one world government people are saying we need a new living language let's all just have one language and that's what they want to do i just thought that was interesting i'm not going to read the rest of the commandments there the or the the uh, guides or whatever they call them you can get online you can look it up the georgia guide stones you'll find the information on it but uh it's really not that new they're trying to build a one world government and they know the key to it is everybody has to be able to understand each other and i'm going to show you that's never been god's design god has never wanted one language where everybody just understands each other here on the earth anyhow okay turn back to acts chapter 17 verse 26 and we're going to see one of the most quoted passages here when it comes to races people love to quote this Acts chapter 17 verse 26 and 27 is what we're going to read and it says here and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and that's where most people stop and they'll say well see you know there's no reason to be a racist you know because we're all of one blood we're all descendants of Adam and Eve and they're right. That is true. We are of all one blood. But something happened since Adam and Eve, and that was the flood, and God said, split up. Japheth, you go over there. Ham, you go down there. Shem, you go over that way. God did not say everybody stay together. And you're going to see that here. Look at the rest of verse 26 that most people won't quote. And hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. 
the bounds of their habitation? Well, why is that? Verse 27, that they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. You see, why does God want everybody split up? Why does he want the languages confounded and you go there and you go there and, and you stay in your own country? Why does God want that? Because when you have all these people coming together, all the races and all the religions and cultures and everything, you have to compromise. I mean, think about something. Today in America as a Christian, when you go out and you do any kind of ministry, door-to-door -door or street ministry, how many religions do you need to study to be able to answer people? On any given day, you might run into a witch, you might run into a Jehovah's Witness, a Catholic, a Mormon, Scientology, uh, Seventh-day Adventist. I mean, there are hundreds of religions here in America. Hundreds of them. But now, what would happen if you went to a country where, you know, Iceland or something like that? You know, some place where you have the people that have been there for hundreds, probably thousands of years, and they all have basically one or two religions in their whole country. It'd be a whole lot easier to talk to people like that about the Lord, wouldn't it? You don't have to know all these different things. And I mean, you you know, go back to 1611 in England. What were the religions back then? You had Catholicism. You had the Anglican, you know, the Church of England. You had the Puritans. You had the Presbyterians. And a couple Anabaptists here and there. That was it. Go to Germany back then, 1611. What are you going to have? Lutheran and Catholic, essentially. You know, not much more than that. It's a whole lot easier to witness to people like that, and it's a whole lot easier for them to seek the Lord. You know, I think here in America, the reason we have so many atheists is because they're, you know, most atheists are pretty stupid people, and they're wicked as well. That's why they're atheists. But the reason that you have so many atheists here, I think a lot of them just get confused. <laughs> and they see so many religions, and they just go, forget it. I don't want any part of any of that. I don't believe that there is a God, and they, you know, that's why. And it'd be a lot easier if we just had one or two religions here. But uh, that's why the Lord wants people to be separated by languages and by boundaries. All right, now turn back to the book of Psalms. Psalms 55 is where we're going to go next. Psalm 55. Verse 9. Alright, Psalm 55, verse 9. This is interesting here. Again, uh, this is David speaking, and he says, Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues, for I have seen violence and strife in the city. What would happen if a Catholic and a well, I shouldn't say Catholic because they're the ecumenical, you know, that bring all religions together. We'll say a Jew and a Muslim. <laughs> what would happen if you had a Jew and a Muslim meet each other on, in a dark alley? <laughs> I think you'd have some strife and violence <laughs> in the city as well there. But uh, verse 10, Day and night they go about it upon the walls thereof. Mischief also and sorrow are in the midst of it. Is there mischief and sorrow in the city today? Oh, no, yeah, there's not any of that. Uh, verse 11, Wickedness is in the midst thereof. Deceit and guile depart not from her streets. <laughs> they ought to put those three verses there, you know, verses 9 through 11, 9, 1, 1. They ought to put those verses, you know, on a big sign outside of every city. You know, warning, you're now entering a city, and here's what you got to watch out for. <laughs> you know, all oh, the Bible's not up to date. You know, yeah, right. Okay, turn back to Mark 16. Now we're going to look at this gift of tongues. What is it exactly? What happened there? Mark chapter 16. I did a, a video about tongues and, and about how that... Uh, uh, I actually showed some pages from a witchcraft encyclopedia, an actual <coughs> witch's encyclopedia. It wasn't a Christian publication. <coughs> And they were talking about how that witches and Satanists can speak in tongues. And, you know, it was in their encyclopedia, and I put it on YouTube. 
And um, I got a bunch of uh, charismatics pretty mad at me. And they said, you know, what's your proof? You know, because I said tongues aren't for today. And they said, what's your proof? And I said, well, I'm going to work on something. So that's why I'm doing this message this morning. And now we're going to look at what this gift of tongues is all about. Okay, we have seen that tongues is a language. Okay, that's what we've seen so far. It's a language. It's not some kind of a mystical, magical thing that is brand new that just happened in the book of Acts on the day of Pentecost. Okay, the word tongues in the Bible is used interchangeably with languages. Okay, so let's see what happened here. Mark chapter 16, verse 14. Afterward he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. Now, I just wanted to read that because I wanted to throw something else in here, which has come up recently, and I just wanted to make a point about it. And that is there's this statement that uh, among Christians, I've heard it actually preached from the pulpit, they say, well, they were saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross, and now we're saved by looking back to the cross. Well, they might mean well by saying that, but they're, it's not true. Okay, it's a lie. They were not saved in the Old Testament by looking forward to the cross. Number one, the cross is a Roman form of execution. Okay, the Roman Empire was not around, you know, thousands of years ago. Okay, back in the Old Testament. Number two, you can see right here, verse 14, Jesus is upbraiding them. He's rebuking them because they didn't believe in the cross. They didn't, they didn't believe in his resurrection and things. They were confused about it. Now, if they were getting saved by looking forward to that, then they wouldn't have been ignorant of it. So that doesn't work. Just wanted to throw that in there. But now look at verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. And we're going to see in a minute what that's all about. Verse 18, They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Okay? Look at verse 18 there. They're going to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. doesn't say anything about, you know, if you have enough faith, you know, you, you'll be able to get well or if you send enough uh, of a seed offering love gift, you know, to this ministry, call in the next 10 minutes and we'll send you this free uh, oil lamp. <laughs> uh-uh. They lay hands on the sick and they recover. And I just want to say that these sign gifts, we're going to see this in a minute, these sign gifts were given to confirm the word. Okay? And, and uh, well, let me just continue on here. We're going to see that. Verse 19, So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Okay? Who were the signs given to? Why were they, you know, confirming the word with signs following? For, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22. We're going to see who the signs were given to. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 22. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Okay, now turn to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. But you know, I just want to make a point here very quickly, and that is that these sign gifts that were given to confirm the word to the Jewish people, uh, the one about the healing thing there, you know, you can, I mean, if you go down through those last couple of verses there in the book of Mark, uh, those sign gifts are no longer here. And you know, that especially this this whole thing of the healing thing. I mean, if if these modern day faith healer guys, it, first of all, faith healer is not in that passage. It doesn't say anything about faith. It says you lay hands on the sick and they recover. But these modern day healers, 
if they really had that gift of healing, that they could just lay hands on the people and they re would recover, why wouldn't they be down at the hospital? I mean, if Benny Hinn and guys like that had that power to lay hands on the sick and they would recover, go down to the hospital and clear it out. You say, oh, yeah, but, you know, it, it takes money to, to run a ministry. Are you kidding me? <laughs> you realize how much money you could make going to hospitals and laying hands on the sick and they'd recover? I mean, go down there, some multimillionaire, you know, Texas oil man down there, and, and he's got cancer, only got a week to live. Uh, be healed, blam, lay your hands on him, cancer's gone. He gets back up and he's walking around. Do you think he wouldn't pay you for that? <laughs> you could get rich, you know. The, see, this whole Benny Hinn thing, multi-million dollar TV sets and every all that, it's a con artist. And I saw him the one time he was talking about his chiropractor, you know, and, and he, he wouldn't know what to do without his chiropractor. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, these sign gifts were given for the Jews, and they're not available today. Okay, and we're going to see why here in just a minute or two. But Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 1 there, you have the event described there in Matthew chapter uh, 16, where it says about um, Jesus being taken back up into heaven. You have that happen in, in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Now, what is the day of Pentecost? Uh, the day of Pentecost is a Jewish feast day. And it's a yearly feast. This isn't some magical day that only happened one time and, and so we'll call ourselves Pentecostal. No. And, you know, I don't, I'm tr not trying to really rip on people here or whatever, but to name your denomination Pentecostal is, you know, it just shows kind of an, in, an ignorance of, of the scriptures here. It's a yearly feast day for the Jewish people. And uh, in Hebrew, if you actually go to a Jewish website or whatever, they call it, uh, I'm probably not going to pronounce this correct, Shavuot, I think is how they, S-H-A-V-U-O-T. I don't know how that's pronounced, but that's, that's how it's pronounced in Hebrew, okay? But the New Testament's written in Greek, so they call it Pentecost. But it happens every year. And if you want to read about it, uh, it's Leviticus chapter 23, verses 15 through 21. Describe this feast, what they're supposed to do. And it happens every year. And Acts chapter 20, verse 16, you don't have to turn there, but it says... For Paul had determined to sail by Ephesus because he would not spend the time in Asia, for he hasted, if it were possible for him, to be at Jerusalem the day of Pentecost. So you see this thing, it's a holiday for the Jews. Paul didn't want to spend his time in Asia. He wanted to get back and to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. It'd be you know kind of like our Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter or whatever. It was a holiday. Okay, so this event that happened here in Acts chapter 2, it was not this special event and they called the day Pentecost. No, it was just it happened on the day of Pentecost. Just wanted to make that point clear. Um, anyhow, let's continue on here. But it says, verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. Now let me just stop there for a minute. Uh, the cloven tongues are like as of fire. And there again, I've seen, you know, there's, a, there's a church I used to go by, this little, I guess, charismatic type church. And they had out on their sign, they had these little dark silhouettes of people with their hands up in the air. And this dove coming down out of heaven and it was on fire. <laughs> uh Watch out for flaming doves coming out of heaven, okay? That's not scriptural. It does not say that these cloven tongues, by the way, it's cloven tongues, not a white dove, but it says the cloven tongues were like as of fire. That's very important to distinguish that. Okay, now, you say, well, give me an example of that. Well, we'll say a motorcycle went by really fast, and you said, man, that guy was flying, he was flying like lightning, like a bolt of lightning now does that mean the guy was lightning 
No, it was like a bolt of lightning. You say, that guy runs like the wind. Well, then he's the wind. No, it's like the wind. Okay, that's what it's saying here. It's like as of fire. And they'll say, they'll talk about the uh, baptism of the Holy Ghost, and they'll refer, again, you don't have to turn here, but Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 through 12 says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And they say, oh, see, you know, that's the fire there is the Holy Ghost. No, it is not. How do you know? Verse 12, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. This baptism of fire is hell. It's not the Holy Spirit. Okay? And, but they, they twist the scriptures all around and they talk about the baptism of fire and things. It's just, it's, it's a very messed up system and, and you do well to stay away from it. Okay, now look at verse 4. Acts chapter 2, verse 4. And we're going to read down through uh, verse 15. <clears throat> and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What are tongues? They're languages. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews. The Jews require a sign. Devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because they ha that every man heard them speak in his own language. Verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Now look at verse 9 down through 11. Okay, yeah, there again you have 9, 11. But uh, down through there again, all the languages are listed. Verse 9, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and in Cappadocia, in Pontus, in Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia in Egypt and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? So you have the tongues listed. Uh, I'm going to continue on here, but just let me ask you a question real quick. Were there any, were there any interpreters? needed in this passage? No. Were there any unknown tongues in this passage? No. They're all listed. Okay, now look at uh, verse 13. Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Now that's another important thing to get right there because a lot of times you'll mock this, these modern charismatics when they start doing their, you know, tongue speaking which is just a made up babble that they make up themselves it's not an actual language and we've seen the term tongues refers to languages always refers to languages and you mock these people and they say you've blasphemed the holy ghost you know you, you've committed the unpardonable sin right there verse 13 it says that they mocked them they mocked the actual gift of speaking in tongues now look at what peter says Verse 14, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. Why didn't Peter say that they blasphemed the Holy Ghost there? They were mocking, speaking in tongues. Why didn't he say it? See, because there's no scripture behind that. What it is, is a bunch of modern charismatics that fake the gift of tongues. And when you confront them and say, you're faking. Oh, you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost. See, they use it as a threat with no scripture behind it. So don't fall for that. Okay, now we're going to go to Acts chapter 10. We're going to see the next time that tongues is mentioned. Acts chapter 10, verse 44. Okay, Acts chapter 10, verse 44 through 48. 
While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, and as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Isn't that interesting? Who was there? Jews. And what happened? The Gentiles started speaking in tongues. Why? To confirm to the Jews that the Gentiles also were getting saved and were receiving the Holy Ghost. But again, you see the, the actual gift of tongues there. There's no interpreter. There's no unknown tongues. It's a language. And the Gentiles, you know, how many Gentiles do you know that can speak Hebrew fluently? But this is what's going on here. These Gentiles are receiving the tongues and they're speaking and the Jews that are standing around are going, wow, look at this. You know, isn't this marvelous? Look at, look at that. The Gentiles are receiving the Holy Ghost. They're speaking with our tongue here. They were impressed with it. The Jews are present. There's no unknown tongues and there's no need for an interpreter. It's very important to remember that. Okay, now we're going to go to the last reference to tongues in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. Okay. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. John the Baptist there. Verse 4, Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands up upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. Now, if you remember Apollos there, that's mentioned in verse 1, uh, back when they met him, um, well, actually, chapter 18 there, We'll just go up and read that quick. Chapter 18, verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took un him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, uh, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews in that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. So Apollos was part of the same group of Jews who knew only about the baptism of John. Okay, they were in another part of the, of the world there. They didn't hear about Jesus dying on the cross and coming up from the grave. They weren't. They had not had the gospel explained to them. But they had heard about the baptism of John and they were baptized and they were going around doing what they knew to do and but they didn't know about Jesus Christ yet. But when they were shown Jesus Christ about how he died for their sins, they were baptized. And of course you have that whole thing too. The book of Acts is a transitional book where you have the gospel transitioning from baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and then it goes to faith grace through faith plus nothing okay baptism is an, is something that we still practice as an ordinance it's something to show your death to the old man and your resurrection as a new creature in Christ Jesus is it necessary for salvation not really but we still do practice it as something that is symbolic okay and i think it is important for a believer today but 
A lot of people get messed up because they go into the book of Acts, the early part of the book of Acts, where it's still transitioning over and the gospel is still going to the Jews. And they take verses out of the early part of the book of Acts about baptism and they apply it to today. And that shouldn't be that way. Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. Okay, it's the gospel that's revealed to Paul. But that's a whole other study. But you see here again, this gift of tongues, and it comes to Jews. Okay, so all three references to tongues in the book of Acts, it's all connected with the Jews. And there are no interpreters, and there, and there are no unknown tongues. Now that's important to distinguish that. Okay, now we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. And we're going to see that this is not the same thing as what was going on in the book of Acts. Something's changing here. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Ye know that ye were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God which worketh all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another uh, discerning of spirits, to another divers kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. Why is the interpretation now showing up? We're going to see as we continue on here. Verse 11, But all these worketh that one and the selfsame Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Okay, so you have verse 10 there, tongues and an interpreter of tongues shows up. Jump down to verse 28 there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Okay, now what is the more excellent way? Again, there you see about the thing of tongues and the interpretation of it. Uh, what is the more excellent way? Well, we have 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the chapter on charity. We're going to look at that in just a minute here. But I believe that the apostles, I do not believe in apostles being for today. I think the apostles were the original 12 there, uh, the 11, and then you had... Paul being the twelfth, and I believe that those apostles were given signs to confirm the word, and after they died, there weren't any more apostles, and the sign gifts disappeared. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 11 through 12 says, I am become a fool in glory, and ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you, for nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Of course, this is Paul writing, and he says in verse 12, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So this thing of the signs of the apostles, I think that that was back then with the original 12, and they could impart that to other believers, certainly, to confirm the word to the Jews. But I do not believe that these signs are still available today. I know that there are people in the charismatic movement that try to call themselves apostles. Well, I'd like to see them actually perform the real sign gifts. They can't. They can fake their way through it. They can fake their way into, into blibbering and blabbering some tongue that they created themselves. But I'd actually like to see them get around some Jews and start speaking perfect Hebrew. 
I'd like to see that. I never have. I'd like to see him lay hands on the sick and they would recover. Not, oh, you know, I think I'm, I'm starting to feel better and a week later they're better. Uh, uh They lay hands on the sick and they recover. I'd like to see it. I never have. Okay, this, this modern charismatic apostle movement, they're just, it's lying signs and wonders is all it is. But look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verse 1. It says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. You know, is it in Colossians where it says about charity is the bond of perfectness? Colossians 3.14, yeah. Colossians 3.14, okay, yeah. Charity is a very important for a Christian to be able to have charity for people. Okay, and read 1 Corinthians chapter 13 sometime and, and you'll see about that. We also have a message on charity and the importance of it. But verse 8, look down at verse 8, 1 Corinthians 13 verse 8. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Charity's never going to fail, the others will. Now we're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. And we're going to see exactly what's going on here with this thing of tongues. You know, because what they do, and I'm very familiar with this because I've, I've had to deal with it now a couple times, the modern charismatic will blend 1 Corinthians 14 and Acts chapter 2. They'll mix them right together. And they're not the same thing. They're not even close to being the same thing. There are no interpreters in Acts chapter 2. The tongues are listed in Acts chapter 2. There are no unknown tongues in Acts chapter 2. Jews are present in Acts chapter 2. And all those things do not apply to 1 Corinthians 14. Something else is going on here. Now 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1. Follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the whole church, or the church. I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied, for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret, that the church may receive edifying. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you, except I shall speak to you either by revelation, or by knowledge, or by prophesying, or by doctrine? And even things without life, giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For ye shall speak into the air. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh a, bar a barbarian, and he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me." All right, now, we just read there about this thing of uh, somebody speaking in an unknown tongue. Now, what's going on there? Is this some kind of a made-up liberty blabber thing that, that is not an actual language? No. It's, it's unknown because there's no interpreter. And I have here, I'm going to, we have a special guest here this morning, a recording. <laughs> And we're going to see exactly what an unknown tongue is. الإنجيل كما دونه يوحنا يبدو المسيح في هذا الإنجيل الذي دونه يوحنا بكونه الكلمة الأزلي الذي أظهر محبة الله. Does anybody know what he's saying? صار بشرا لكي يخلص من الهلاك من يؤمنون به ويهبهم الحياة الأبدية. Does anybody have any idea? ويبدأ الإنجيل بالكلام عن أزلية المسيح. See, if that guy was here this morning and he started saying that stuff, nobody here can interpret him. What is it? It's an unknown tongue. See, it's not something that the guy made up. It's an actual language. It's a tongue 
But if that guy came here and he wanted to tell us that right there, nobody here understands it. And we're going to see here, he should just keep his mouth shut then. If nobody here would be able to serve as an interpreter, then he should be quiet. Now, what he was saying there was actually John chapter 1 in Arabic is what that was. And uh, let me show you another example here quick. Just to show you exactly what I'm talking about here. This one even has music that goes with it. Okay, be quiet. Women are commanded to be quiet or silent in the church. Okay, she, should, she shouldn't have been speaking in tongues there. We're going to see that actually in a minute. That was Mandarin. And she was reading Romans chapter 12. Okay, was there anything wrong with what either one of those people were saying? No, they were reading the Bible. But the point is, it was an unknown tongue. So they should not have been speaking without an interpreter. And the interesting point here is, if you look at Corinth on a map, back in the back of your Bible there, it was a seaport. And it's right in the middle of all of these different countries. So guess what there would have been a lot of at Corinth? There would have been a huge number of different tongues. A lot of them. So they would have been having believers coming in all the time to their assembly there who would probably not speak the language that most of the people were accustomed to. And many times you'll have people that are from a foreign country that they come and they understand English, but they themselves, they just can't, they can't speak it well. Now, what's being said here in 1 Corinthians 14 is, if you're a believer from another country and you come in there and you understand what's being said and you want to speak up and say something, if there's nobody there to interpret what you're going to say, then keep your mouth shut. Don't speak in an unknown tongue. Okay, it's not this some kind of a magical new language that just shows up with the Holy Spirit and liberty blabberty. No, it's unknown because there's no interpreter. And see... To compare that to the tongues in the book of Acts, it doesn't work because there are no interpreters in the book of Acts. There's no unknown tongues in the book of Acts. It was a Jewish sign gift. But now you have something happening here. Now you have Gentile believers. That's who Paul's writing to, the Corinthians. And you have this huge diversity of tongues, of languages. That's what's going on. Okay, the Holy this this gift that was given to confirm the word to the Jews is gone. It's out of there. And I'm going to show you that in just a little bit. But look down at 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 18 through 20. I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all. Paul spoke a couple different languages. Yet in the church I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. How much of a blessing would you get if, if I played that recording there? We'll say the, the guy reading John chapter 1 in Arabic. We could listen to the whole chapter and you wouldn't understand a word the guy said. How much of a blessing would that be to you? Zero. Yeah, zero. Nothing. See, you speak five words if I say, Jesus Christ will save you today. That's probably six words, isn't it? That's more of a blessing than to listen to this Arabic guy for an hour. That's what Paul's saying there. Now look at verse 20. Here you have Paul rebuking the carnal Corinthians. Brethren, be not children in understanding, howbeit in malice be ye children, but in understanding be men. If you're going to get mad and act like a little brat, go ahead, but understand this and be a man. That's what Paul's saying. Verse 21. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, and yet for all that, they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Even though the apostles were given the sign gifts of speaking in tongues and healing and casting out devils and drinking poisonous things and taking up deadly serpents, even though they were given those signs, did the Jews as a nation, did they accept Jesus Christ? Did they listen to the Lord? No. 
No, not at all. Okay? So the sign thing is not as important as actually reading the Bible. Verse 22, Wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Okay, so you have right there, the signs were the tongues were given for a sign. And who requires the sign? The Jews. I mean, how can you take this stuff out of context and apply it to a bunch of American Christians in some big megachurch somewhere acting wacky? It doesn't work. Uh, verse 23, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place, and all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? You know, that's one of the other sad things about this tongues movement. And the modern tongues movement is not even close to what was going on back here. But this charismatic church with all the weird things that they do, and... There are videos out there. I think the one's called um, uh, Wolves in Sheep's Clothing, or I, I can't remember the name of it, but it's incredible to see what goes on in some of these really radical, the Toronto Blessing and some of these really radical churches. I mean, they're just really, really wild. And guess what happens when an unbeliever sees that? You know, if you ask the average unbeliever, if you ask, ask the average lost man about Christianity, most of them will bring up Benny Hinn. Because they know that it's it's just nonsense. It's wackiness. See, it's a major stumbling block to people. And that's what going on what's going on there. Now look at verse twenty four. But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Now prophesying for today you can still do it in the sense of showing them the scriptures, okay, where the scriptures foretell things that are currently going on. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19, the first part of it says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. And you can tell people, hey, the Bible said there's going to be an increase in earthquakes. You know? And there is. It's incredible the amount of earthquakes that are going on right now. I mean, it's, it's you know, a couple of months. Now, and they're not little earthquakes. They're huge earthquakes. Little earthquakes, there's probably some going on almost every day somewhere in the world. I mean, it's it's incredible. The Bible says there, there'd be an increase in war, pestilence, famine, you know, that there would be a one-world government. And now they're announcing it on the news. So you can show people what the Bible prophesied would happen, and it's coming to pass. And get them to believe in prophecy and then say, the Bible also talks about heaven and hell and salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. So, you can use prophecy for the unbeliever. Now look at verse 26 down through 28. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, that all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. Did you ever go to a missionary conference and you get some native or something like that from that country and they come and they want to give their testimony? I've seen that. But they have an interpreter. Would it, wouldn't it be just weird to have the guy stand up there and speak in Spanish or in German or whatever and nobody interprets? See, it wouldn't make any sense. And what, what would it be like if they had six people that came up from that country and all six of them stood up and just started talking at one time. Huh. That's the kind of carnal stuff that was going on back there in the Corinthian church. And Paul is correcting them and saying, no, no more than three. And by the way, look at verse 27. It says, if any man speak. Man, not woman. We're going to see about that in just a minute here. But it says, verse 27, If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and that one interpret. Take your turn there, that by course. Verse 28, But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Okay? I mean, it's just, it's so crystal clear. I don't know how people can get this all mixed up. 
Now, if you want to read verses 34 through 35 sometime, we're not going to right now, but it says about let your women keep silence in the churches. Okay, that's a whole other study. But, you know, verse 27 says very clearly that it's a man that's allowed to speak in, you know, another tongue, but it's only to be at the most three, and they're to take their turns by course, the Bible says, and there has to be an interpreter there. And if there's no interpreter, then they're to be quiet. Okay, this is not the same. 1 Corinthians 14 is not the same as the book of Acts. Okay, but now do the sign gifts, what about these sign gifts? Are they still here today, the sign gifts of the apostles? Well, I'm going to show you what happened. Acts chapter 18. Now, who were the signs for? As we covered earlier, the signs were for the Jews, right? Acts chapter 18, uh, verses 5 and 6. It says, And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he, took, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. Jesus as the Messiah was offered to the Jews and God used the apostles to confirm the word with signs following. But towards the end of the book of Acts, the Jews as a nation said, no, we reject Jesus Christ. And they still do today, by the way. And you can read about that in Romans chapter 11. God's not cast them away. They're not done. God's not done with them yet. Okay, but when they rejected Jesus Christ, God said, okay, Paul, go to the Gentiles. And that's what you have there. Romans back to the book of Philemon. You have the Pauline epistles there where Paul is writing to Gentile believers. And most of you, all of us here this morning, and most of you listening to this are Gentile believers. And so your main doctrine needs to come from the Pauline epistles. That doesn't mean you can't read anything else in the Bible. It just means you need to be careful when you get into the other books. Okay, but Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. And he, as an apostle, had the sign gifts. But when those sign gifts were given to confirm the word to the Jews, and when the Jews rejected, and he said, okay, I'm going to the Gentiles from now on. The Gentiles don't seek after signs. They don't require a sign. We seek after wisdom. Okay? The sign gifts disappeared. He said, well, prove that. Okay? They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Right? Mark chapter 16. Well, we're not going to look all these up, but uh, Paul, who was able to heal quite a few people, he brought a guy back from the dead. Uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20, it says, Trophimus have I left at my leadum sick. Why didn't he heal him? Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 23, he recommends Timothy to drink wine for his stomach's sake and his often infirmities. Why didn't he heal him? And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10, Paul talks about that he has a thorn in the flesh and he besought the Lord thrice that he might take it away from him. And God said, no. Well, why couldn't he heal himself? See, this gift of healing went away. And I believe that the gift of tongues also went away as far as what was going on in the book of Acts. Now, you still have this thing of there being a lot of different languages out there. And remember, tongues and languages is used interchangeably. Tongues are not something separate from language. And if you're in an area where there are a lot of different tongues, I do think that there is a gift in as much as there are some people who are gifted with knowing other languages and with interpreting other languages. But this Holy Spirit, cloven tongues of fire that comes down, you know, like as a fire, and all this, and you can speak with new tongues, and you go out as the Spirit gives you utterance and all that. No. No. That was the book of Acts. That was the transition period. The only tongues that you need to worry about right now is if you're around other believers that have other languages. And I do think that there are Christians that are more gifted at 
knowing languages. Okay, now in, in closing here, uh, we're just going to look at uh, six problems that I have with this charismatic thing of speaking in tongues. First problem that I have with it is it's fake. And I was going to play some recordings. I mean, you can hear some of these things. That there's the one video I referred to earlier. Like I said, I don't remember the name of it. If you're if you're curious about it, uh, write to me and, and uh, I can send you a copy of it. But it actually has um, Kenneth Copeland and Rodney Howard, two big charismatic um, personalities, and they're telling jokes in tongues. Uh, which is ridiculous. There's no scripture at all for that. And it actually has a, a thing where Kenneth Copeland calls a guy up to the stage and he he's and he and he right in the middle of it he goes take the mark of the beast like that. In the middle of his speaking in tongues he tells a guy to take the mark of the beast. And you can hear it just as plain as day. See, there is a demonic spirit there and when you just allow yourself to go kind of limp and just allow your tongue to go loose and just have this spirit come, come spirit, come that's very dangerous and I think a lot of these people in these churches are lost and I think that's why they're getting possessed with devils like crazy the number, the second thing that I have against this tongues movement is that there are oftentimes uh, other manifestations, other quote unquote gifts of the Holy Spirit and these things don't appear in scripture you have holy laughter. Show me that one time in the Bible where they were just going into this uncontrolled laughter. And this is the Holy Spirit. You had this jerking thing. And, you know, there were even Methodists that were doing that. Back in the old revival days and stuff, I read about Peter Cartwright. He'd go around to these revivals and these people would get jerking and stuff like that. Where's that at in the scriptures? It's not in there. People rolling around on the floor and barking like dogs and, and things. It's not in the Bible. Okay, well, what is this stuff? But it's often accompanied with this whole, it goes along with that whole tongues movement. Man, just I'd stay away from that. Uh, the third problem I have, um, they use verses in Acts uh, before the gospel was fully revealed to prove that the Holy Ghost comes at a different, uh, comes at a different time than salvation. Okay, in other words, they say, <clears throat> well, you get saved over here, and then you got to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost over there. Now that some of that did go on in the early part of the book of Acts, but today, Ephesians chapter one verse thirteen. Uh, actually, we'll turn there very quickly because it is important to, to see this. Ephesians one thirteen. When do you receive the Holy Ghost? Actually, go to Ephesians chapter one verse seven first. It says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his glory, or sorry, according to the riches of his grace. Verse 13, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also that ye believed ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Did you have to seek the Holy Spirit? No. When you believe you're sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. You get saved and you get the Holy Spirit all in the same moment, the same instance. You don't have to seek Him and have the initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking in unknown tongues. That's nonsense. Okay? And the Bible doesn't teach that. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. You say, well, you know, I, I remember we talked the one time to this guy and he said, I don't always have as much as the Holy of the Holy Spirit as I'd like to have, you know. I mean, it's it's... You know, what do you, what do you go to the Holy Spirit gas station and get a couple gallons or something? You know, what is this? Uh, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. When you get saved, you have the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. And you're sealed by the Holy Spirit. You don't lose the Holy Spirit or have less of the Holy Spirit today than you did yesterday. But you can grieve the Holy Spirit. Okay, now you'll lose you'll lose some communication with God there as far as or communion with God, I should say. But that doesn't mean you have less less of the Holy Spirit. When you get saved, you get receive the Holy Spirit and you have him unto the day of redemption as a Christian in the church age. So 
it's it's a heretical teaching. This thing of you get the Holy Spirit at some other time. Turn to Romans chapter eight. I'm going to show you why it's a heretical belief system. Romans chapter eight, verse nine. This guy, you know, I don't always have as much of the Holy Spirit as I'd like to, and I, you know, I got saved, but I still have to seek the Holy Spirit, and He'll come at some point. Romans chapter eight, verse nine says, "But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of His." Well, I haven't received the Holy Ghost yet. Well, then you better receive Jesus Christ. <laughs> Because if you're trying to say that you have Jesus Christ and you don't have the Holy Spirit yet, well, you're not saved. You receive Jesus Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit. They're one and the same. Okay, so important to understand that. Number four, what do you have? The number four problem that I have with the charismatic movement, the tongues thing, what do you have when you have some people that have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and some people that have not? What do you have? You have a two-tier system. You have some Christians that are better than others. These ones are up here on this plateau up here, and then these are down here. You're not quite as spiritual as I am. I can speak in tongues, and you cannot. You have not received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. See, you have this system. See, that's not scriptural. That's ridiculous. You get saved, you receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, now, you might not be obeying the Holy Spirit. You might be living in sin and things like that, but that doesn't mean that you have less of the Holy Spirit. That just means that you're not obeying and submitting to Him. You're grieving the Holy Spirit. That's the difference there. There are Christians that are better in their walk with the Lord, but it doesn't mean because they've got more of the Holy Spirit. No. They're just submitting more to Him. So, again, another problem. Number five, uh, which I stated earlier, this weird ways of holy laughter and jerking and acting like an animal and stuff, it's a stumbling block to the lost. You have a lost individual go into one of these churches and they see these people acting weird, they're not going to get saved. They're not going to want anything to do with Christianity. They're going to run from it. See, it's a stumbling block. And the Bible says, I think it's in the book of Hebrews, it says about the assembling of the saints is to be with, with reverence and godly fear. A church setting should be reverent. It shouldn't be a bunch of people acting like nuts doing cartwheels down the aisles. And, you know, they, they have a, another thing I've seen. They say about you're to be drunk with the Holy Spirit. And they have people that are acting like they're drunk. And, and it's interesting, too. I've seen some of these really radical charismatic meetings. And they have the people going up front to receive the Holy Ghost, which is idiotic. And they have women... And they receive, quote-unquote, the Holy Ghost, and they start taking their clothes off. And they have, they have people up front, stagehands with blankets, that, that put the blanket over the woman while she's starting to, to pull her shirt up or something like that. And you tell me that's of the Lord? You tell me that that's the Holy Spirit imploring them to do that? No, it isn't. And I mean, this stuff sounds radical, but you can research it and you'll see it for yourself. And number six, the sixth problem I have with the charismatic speaking in tongues movement is that it didn't show up until the late 1800s or early 1900s. It wasn't around before then. Where was it back in the Reformation years? It wasn't around. But uh, you say, well, what about this thing of signs and wonders? Well, let's finish up this study by going to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And that's where we're going to finish this morning. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, I guess verse 8. Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. When are signs going to show up again? Well, let's look. And then shall that wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. That's very interesting. The Antichrist is going to come and he's going to have signs and wonders. Hmm. Kind of interesting there. And what's going to happen? Verse 10, And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, 
but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Signs and wonders are not for today in the church age. The thing that ends the church age is the rapture of the body of Christ, which you have there in uh, verse 6. And now you know what withholdeth. I'm sorry. Uh, where is it here? Verse 7. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The taken out of the way there is the body of Christ. When we are gone, the Antichrist shows up, and guess what he brings? Signs and wonders. And you're going to have a lot of these radical charismatics that are lost, that are trying to seek the Holy Ghost and all this other stuff, and they're going to go right into this time period, and they're going to accept that Antichrist because he's going to bring signs and wonders. What a tragedy. But you say, what about the Jews? The Jews require signs. Yeah, that's the purpose of the time of Jacob's trouble. This coming seven-year period that a lot of people call the Great Tribulation. It's going to be seven years where any Jew can read the book of Revelation and they can see all the events coming to pass. And right now they don't accept the book of Revelation, but they will during that tribulation time period. So God's going to be working signs, but so is the devil. And that's something else that's interesting. Can Satan work signs and lying wonders? You better believe it. Sure he can. You know, there are, there are Catholics that say they go to these Mary shrines and they get healing. Yeah, the devil can do that stuff. But there's a price that you pay when the devil does a sign for you. Okay, so don't fall for this tongues thing. Uh, do not, again, you cannot take out of context what was going on in the book of Acts and try to apply it with 1 Corinthians. Okay, tongues, there are other languages out there. And, and if you're gifted at that, knowing other languages, then you should use that gift to honor the Lord. You know, help people out, interpret things for people. Maybe translate different books, four different languages. Okay, but this Holy Spirit sign gift of speaking in tongues for the Jews, no, I don't believe it's for today. I have never seen anything that would convince me that it's still going on. This blabbery stuff that they pull off in the modern churches is not the gift of tongues. Okay, it is a lying sign and wonder. Please don't be deceived by it. Uh, like I said, if you want to know the, the name of that video, get in contact with me. I can um, talk to you about it or, or whatever. So thank you for listening. I guess that's it. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. If these sermons or videos have been a blessing to you, please help us to continue this work by supporting this ministry. You can send a check payable to Brian Denlinger to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 300, Bradford, PA 16701. Or you can donate online through PayPal at our website, www.kingjamesvideoministries.com. Thank you, and may the Lord Jesus Christ bless you.